Magandang araw, Podmates. Howie Severino muli na nagpapaalala na nakakatalino ang mahabang attention span. Tuloy ang gera sa Middle East. Ang guest natin ngayon ay may mga kamag-anak doon dahil siya ay mistisang uh, Palestinian. Nakatira siya ngayon sa Pilipinas at isa sa mga bosses dito ng mga Palestino. She is half Filipina and half Palestinian and she has had a colorful life journey. Bilang beauty queen, host at influencer habang siya ay nagsasalita tungkol sa mga masasalimuot na issue sa gitnang silangan. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today, Zara Bianca Saldua, second runner-up in the Miss World Philippines pageant in 2013. She has a wide range of advocacies, but most recently, the plight of Palestinians. Uh, magandang araw sa'yo, Zara Saldua. You permitted me to call you by your nickname, Z. Hello, Z. Hello, Howie. Maraming salamat sa pag-invite dito sa inyong podcast. Uh, napakalaking honor po sa akin. At syempre, tuwang-tuwa ako sa mga storya na pinibigay mo sa ating mga kababayan. And ngayon, isa na ako doon. <laughs> thank you. The honor is ours, uh, Z. No? Um, thank you for joining us. You have an uncommon family background, uh, of course, no. but in a way it's familiar because you're a child of the Filipino diaspora and also, of course, the Palestinian diaspora. Uh, your father is uh, Filipino and a former OFW uh, in Kuwait, and your mom is Palestinian. Uh, how did they meet? Uh, it's really funny. My mother was also part of the Palestinian diaspora who was in Kuwait at that time, and then they met in a Katumbas ng SM, it was called mm-hmm. Safeway. It's an American brand. Mm-hmm. And then yung dad ko yung parang boss ng mom ko. Tapos doon sila nagkaroon ng konting connection, nag-uusap. And my father was just really doing the Filipino way of um, of making legal, going to the house talaga. <laughs> Imagine. And my, my grandparents were like, who is this man? Does he even speak Arabic? Which he knows a little of. My mother know how to know how to speak Filipino kasi ang dami niya mga friends na taga uh, taga Pilipinas, 'di ba? Nakasama niya diyan na mga OFW. Kaya doon sila nagkaroon ng counting connection tapos nagka-developan and then naging <laughs> nagkasal na sila agad. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so they were both overseas workers. Your your mom uh is not originally from Kuwait. I know she's Palestinian, no, but mm-hmm. Palestinians can be anywhere right now, no. Uh but was she also an overseas worker, considered an overseas worker in Kuwait at that time? I don't think you can consider her an overseas worker because yung pagstay nila doon sa Kuwait was not really their choice. It was my parents who I see. were kicked out of the country, you know, and then they stayed in Jordan and Kuwait. That's why you'll see my family members that are in Palestine, in Kuwait, and in Jordan. Medyo kalat na sila ngayon. But if you ask any of them, they will say, I'm Palestinian. They won't say that I'm Kuwaiti or I'm Jordanian because that's where they're originally from. So they're they're a mixed couple in the sense that, you know, they, they come from two separate cultures. Sabi mo nga, yung grandparents mo na Palestinian nag-react sa, sa tatay mo sa pang, pangliligaw. No? Of course, very different. Yeah. Culture. So, how did they? How was he received at first? Uh, I mean, paano ba yung culture ng Palestinians? Uh, are they welcoming uh, towards foreigners, uh, or was it, you know, was it more wary? Uh, to be honest, when it comes to interracial marriages in Islam, particularly, it's very, it's very promoted. No, they really want you to have interracial marriages because. Oh, yeah. sabihin, nakakaroon talaga tayo ng one nation, di ba? And you get to understand each other's uh, background. Pero, syempre, pagdating sa araw na yun, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, some of them are a little bit more conservative than they are right now. My grandparents were just shocked because in the Arab culture, especially if babae yung anak mo, hindi hindi agad agad na lumalapit ang lalaki sa pamilya. It's usually pamilya sa pamilya. Parang nung araw dito sa Pilipinas dati, pamilya sa pamilya din, din yon. So ganun, ganun din sila. And up to this day, there are a lot of people who have that culture of um yung panliligaw is pamamanhikan agad. Hindi siya yung panliligaw na yung lalaki lang. They still welcomed him into the house because... Surprisingly, not pe- not many people know about this, but Arabs and Filipinos are two of the most hospitable races in the world. No, 
And Arab will say, just come to the house, have some coffee, have some tea. They don't even ask you if kumain ka na ba. They just put food in front of you. So they did that also to my father. Now, niwalkom siya naman sa bahay. Naging kaibigan niya yung tito ko na best friend sila. So doon din nakuha yung loob ng mom ko, ng loob ng, ng grandparents ko. And they gave the blessing na na magpakasal sila. I know what you mean about this Arab hospitality, you know, because I I covered um uh, Iraq, no, right before mm. the war, the the U.S. invasion there, and I didn't expect it, but I really experienced that hospitality. I I was I was a stranger, of course, a foreigner there, but I was constantly being invited into people's homes. I you know I was just sh- shooting a wedding party outside the hotel. Kinumbida ako na maging wedding guest. No, yeah. I I can't imagine I can't imagine that even happening here. Diba? I mean, I mean, bilang yung mga guests, diba? Sa wedding. Pero yeah, ako, true. Patay yung cameraman ko, kinumbida kami doon sa sa wedding. I mean, it was, you're right, no? I mean, very, very hospitable. In fact, I I I found them even more hospitable than, <laughs> than Filipinos. And Filipinos are already very hospitable. Hospitable, no? yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So, so nagkatuluyan yung magulang mo. And uh, mm-hmm. where were you born? I was born in Jordan. So, naabutan nila yung... Uh, yung Kuwait war with Iraq, di ba, that time. And then, umalis sila papuntang, papuntang Italy for a year. I was conceived in Italy, apparently. Kaya yung second name ko is Bianca. And then they okay. moved to Jordan because my mother wanted to be closer to her family. And um, mm. by that time, lumipat na yung lola at lolo ko sa Jordan. So, from there, that's where we stayed for most of my life. I was there for 13 years. My father... In general, sa Middle East, nasa 25 years po siya. So, yun, mm-hmm. doon kami lumaki ng kapatid ko din. So, uh, where, where did you go to school? I mean, uh, obviously, right, well, now you, you speak English very well. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming you also learned that in the Philippines. Pero, uh, doon sa Jordan, uh, po, nag-aaral ka ba sa Arab school or international school or or what? I actually studied in modern American school, so it is mm-hmm. an American school. We had a lot mm-hmm. of lot of cultures there, a lot of races, a lot of uh, people locally and internationally. So mm-hmm. my English really came from that and watching a lot of American or Western-based movies. And mm-hmm. my Filipino was really bad at that time. My first language is English and then Arabic and then Filipino. When I moved here, naging English, then Filipino, then Arabic. Kasi wala naman ako masyadong nakakausap sa Arabic, di ba? So, Filipino became my second language naman. And I've heard you speak uh, Arabic, no? Uh, so, uh, you sabi mo, wala ka masyadong nakakausap dito. But, you know, ako, ako pamilya ko, may, mahilig sa uh, Arab food, no? Uh, mm. you, and you find them all over the place, no? Uh, but, you are any of your circles uh, Palestinian or Arab here in the Philippines na, where you can pra- actually speak uh, Arabic with them? And um... Yeah, it's only after the pandemic where I started seeing these type of businesses pop up na mga Arabs mm-hmm. and they're my age. Kasi before, mm-hmm. yung mga Arabs na nandito, madalas sila mga ka-age ng mga parents ko. So, syempre, hindi kami mm-hmm. masyado nakakapag-usap. And then, mm-hmm. yung mindset is different. The conversations are different. But now, there are millennials, there are Gen Zs na nakakausap ko na dito. And nalaman ko na, ah, okay, may marami pa pala mga Arab na kabataan or mga young Arabs who are here that I got to talk to. So, now we have mm-hmm. certain groups. Um, Some of them are married to Filipinas as well. So I get to be really close friends with their wives and then mm-hmm. them or their husbands. So mm-hmm. maganda din kasi bilang isang mixed child, parang na, nakikita ko na rin kung paano yung parents ko nung araw no, nung magkasama na sila. So I would be definitely relating to their children or giving advice mm-hmm. as someone who is mixed. So b- back to Jordan, no? that's where you spent most of your childhood. Tama ba, Jordan? Tama. Oh, and where where in Jordan? I I've been to Amman, no, because that's where Aman. you land. If you if you uh okay, because that's that's where journalists go if they want to go to yeah. Iraq back back then, diba? the, the, Then you travel across the desert by by land, no. So, uh, this is a Jordan. Were you very aware of your Filipino ness also, or was it mostly your Palestinian Arab side? It was really a very good mix because my father was very involved with the Filipino community. He was the mm-hmm. president of the OFWs there you know as a 
as a part of their mm-hmm. club. Siya yung nag-organize ng mga events wow. at nag mc siya ng mga events ng Philippine mm-hmm. Independence Day. Which is mm-hmm. funny kasi ngayon ako yung nag-organize at <laughs> ako yung nag-host ng mga events, di ba? Mm-hmm. Um, and my mother was a translator for the Filipino OFWs who had a hard time with the Arab workers there or, or the Arab bosses there. So she spoke English, Filipino, and Arabic. She speaks Filipino better than my father, basically. So she's the one who translates to them. Oh, even in Bisaya, she's a lot of Bisaya. So how did you learn that your mom is pure Palestinian? Pure Palestinian, yes. She started mm-hmm. at the hospital when she was in her teens. And of course, there were Filipino there at that mm-hmm. time. Okay. So she learned. Na and then even in Jordan, she kept learning and understanding. So she was also kind of the mediator whenever there were problems with OFW. So we were really at the center of OFWs in, the, in Amman, Jordan. And then when it came to my Arab side, I was very close with my cousins and very close with my uncles. They loved my father. My father calls my grandparents like mother and father talaga. They really love him so much. My cousin right now has a Filipino store in Amman and he's he's and, Arab. And your cousin is pure Palestinian. Pure Palestinian. So he has a Filipino he, store. He speaks Filipino and all of his cous- all of his uh, brothers and sisters know how to speak Filipino, even my uncles as well. So we're very we're very close knit. I feel like I got the best of both worlds. Mm. Well, that's uh, that's amazing. Even your Palestinian cousins can speak Filipino. Yeah. So uh, you spent 13 years uh, in the Middle East. So I guess at 13 years old, that means at 13 years old, um, lumipat na kayo sa Pilipinas because of the war. Tama ba yun? Yes, it's true. That was the height, I think, of when America started invading Iraq. And uh, mm-hmm. we felt like a lot of our businesses there was being affected because when we were importing Filipino goods, a lot of the import was really being stopped because of the war Mm -hmm. and uh, Mm -hmm. of course we were also thinking about our safety and my parents were thinking maybe we need to move to the Philippines naman para ma-explore din natin yung Filipino side but to be honest we lost a lot of things we lost a lot of businesses we really had to start from scratch pagdating namin dito sa Filipinas so zero contacts zero properties uh, very little money that was used just for the necessities so yun yun yung naging struggle namin you could be considered war refugees in that sense, no? Kasi nilayasan niyo yung gera and yung effects ng gera sa, sa Jordan, sa Middle East, no? Had you been to the Philippines before? Several times. We would come here oh, okay. every year or two. So it's not that I was out of touch with my culture. It was really part of my my being. Actually, sobrang yabang ko na Pilipino ako pagdating doon sa Jordan, sa totoo lang. I would be like, look at the Philippines. Ang dami namin mga mangoes. Ang dami namin mga tropical areas, mga beaches. Kasi walang ganun masyado sa Jordan or it would be very expensive. And uh, pinapakita ko yung mga pictures, pinapakita ko yung culture ng Pilipinas. Pagdating dito naman sa Pilipinas, parang opposite, nag-flip. Ako naman, isang Palestinian. Ito naman yung pagkain namin. Ito naman yung mga meron kami. It's like, they're both home, but I'm also a stranger in both of my homes because I feel like I'm carrying two identities when I'm here, you know? Looking through your Instagram, uh, it you know it's full of uh, happy uh, images and, and content mostly, uh, mm-hmm. you know, about your successes. You know, you're, you're a host and then you also have sponsors. You, you know, you... Uh, mga, mga, you know, like beauty related uh, products uh, and then this month um, you got serious no uh, you started talking about politics history Palestine um, so why did you start speaking up now I think well I've always posted about Palestine but mostly during like independence days or whenever mm-hmm. something would happen I would post about it but more so now because of what mm-hmm. happened uh, or what is happening until now, no? It started on October 7, but it's only the hype that started on October 7. These issues that I've been talking about have started way before October 7. So I thought it was mm-hmm. very important for us to talk about these things, especially on social media, especially for the Filipinos. Dahil marami mga Pinoy, parang iba yung perception nila sa nangyayari doon sa, mm-hmm. sa Palestine. And I just wanted to speak up. I even told some of my sponsors, I'm really sorry, I cannot post at this point. I have to talk about this. If you want to pull out your sponsorship, I completely understand. 
um, if you are willing to wait or if you're willing to give me a chance to post, but not right now on my feed, then I'd be really grateful. But at this point, ito lang talaga ang gusto kong pag-usapan. Wala talaga akong mental capacity even or or emotional mm-hmm. bandwidth to talk about anything else, anything else other than Palestine. And uh, kailang ka na conscientize? I think when I was a child, I didn't really grasp all of these stories that was given to me. You know, say my grandparents would tell me about their experience during 1948 when they were ethnically cleansed. And then, of course, my uncles and my aunts also told me about my culture. Pero 13 years old and below, parang hindi ko talaga masyado na iintindihan ng buong buo. So, as a teen, syempre yung focus ko was like, oh, I'm losing all of my friends. I'm coming here to the Philippines. Wala na akong kaibigan. So, parang hindi ko masyado na na napag-aralan yung nangyayari sa Palestine. I, it was only until I was 20 years old when I started reading more and more about it. And in my early 20s, I became more critis- uh, critical about it. I really wanted to ask the hard questions because I kept hearing one side, which is the Palestinian side. And then I started meeting friends from Israel. And I said, and, and I also started meeting people from like the Israeli Chamber of Commerce and other people. And I said, okay, you know what? I need to broaden my horizons. I need to really educate myself. And I spent I spent years learning more and more, but the past five years intensely studying it when i say intensely like really looking at all of the research coming from both the israeli and the palestinian side really looking at all of the news bits every day following it up really studying and reading books and now i'm 100 percent convinced 100 percent with the palestinian people not just because i'm palestinian but because i did the work because i did the research and i think it's more important now than ever to have that voice because of the genocide happening right now. You mentioned October 7th. What was your reaction to it? Um, unang unang nangyari? Yung mga unang balita doon? Yung unang balita, nung nalaman ko to, I was really nervous more than ever because I said, okay, baka gamitin ito as a way or as an excuse to finally get rid of the people in Gaza. Like, I was really scared for the people in Gaza because I knew that looking at all of the patterns of happening between Israel and Palestine, I knew that Israel was trying to find a way to really take Gaza off and take complete control over it. So that was the first thing that I thought of. And then after that, I started reading more and more posts about how this is, it could be a revolution. It could be the great resistance that we've been waiting for as Palestinian people. And I was like, you know what, this is, hopefully the time that people will really know what is going on in Palestine. And I just kept thinking about before October 7, in 2023 alone, there were more than 200 people who were killed and 40 of them were children. And yet people were still focusing on the attacks, the Hamas attacks, but they never really looked at the context. We're looking at years and years of context, but if they just wanted to go for 2023, those are the facts. We have 200 almost 250 people who were killed by the Israeli Defense Forces. And these were not only in Gaza, most of them were in the West Bank and even children were being killed. So to me, I knew I was going to get a lot of questions from my friends. I knew that my posts were going to be targeted by people who were pro-Israel or pro-Zionist. And I was already getting prepared na, getting pre- prepared na to speak for my people. So that's why I became super serious on my social media. Hamas went into uh, Israel from from mm-hmm. Gaza and you know all these people were killed, uh, you know over a thousand, almost 2000 people. And as a Palestinian, uh, you know as an outspoken uh, Palestinian or Palestinian Filipino, uh, you must have received a lot of comments, questions I mean, even probably well-meaning questions and, and maybe well-meaning comments and feedback, you know, and then, of course, there's a lot of emotion and anger. How did you typically respond and deal with these questions and comments? That's a really great question, to be honest. Um, a lot of people were asking me to condemn Hamas. Like, do you condemn Hamas? And I'm like, okay, I really feel like 
no one condones violence. Nobody wants bad things to happen to innocent people. But whenever the question condemning Hamas comes up, it's always like I'm validating my human humanity. I'm always having to validate that I'm a human first and that I'm not like the others. Like, oh, not all Arabs are like that. Like, I don't think that I should always put myself in a position where because that should have been the default. So that's one of the things that I had to deal with when I'm talking to certain people. A lot of people who had well-meaning questions, of course, they were asking why it happened, which is the perfect question to ask, right? Like, why did Hamas choose to do this attack? And then you get to talk about what's been going on from before October 7, all the way from 1948, because people kept going to the history, go back and back and back and back and back. If we even just look at recent years, you can tell like, okay, oppressed people will try to fight one way or another. That's that's already a fact. It's for every action, there will be a reaction. And that's why, that's how I re- typically respond to people who are asking about October 7 and who are asking about Hamas. But to understand this context, uh, you know, you've mentioned 1948. Uh, at least twice already. So for for listeners who aren't familiar, what's your version of what happened in 1948? 1948 is known worldwide as the Nakba or the catastrophe. This was the time when 750,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed. When we say ethnically cleansed, it wasn't that they were killed, but they were kicked out of their homes or kicked out of their communities or their towns. And a lot of those who were kicked out in 1948 were became refugees of Gaza. 70% of the people in Gaza are refugees from 1948. And a lot of them became part of the diaspora of, of the Palestinians outside, right? My grandparents included. And if people want to know what happened, well, the catalyst was in 1948. So imagine these... Uh, Zionist Jews, we're not going to call them Jews, no, because there's a difference between Jews and Zionist Jews. These Zionist Jews came into Palestine and then they were asking for help because they were also refugees from World War II. They wanted to have a home, so they came in asking for um, for assistance, asking to be welcomed to Palestine, and the Palestinians did so. And then after that, they came into the homes, they kicked out the Palestinian people, and we started having the problems that you see today. So if you look at it in the simple sense, we were colonized. Yeah. But but of course, a part of this context was that whole region had already been colonized. I mean, before what you say is today's colonization, because it was controlled by the British, Tamaba, and then, yes. you know, the, this whole partition of, of Palestine occurred with, you know, UN support and, of course, the Western countries who had won World War II. So they kind of had control over how the world was going to be divided. So the British kind of said, okay, Palestine, you can have, you know, this part. And then, uh, you know, you Zionist Jews or Jews, you can have, you know, uh, uh, this part. Uh, But there was a a lot of disagreement in the Arab world, no, about about how that partition was going to take place and whether there was going to be any partition at all. Yes. You need to kind of... Uh, dig a little bit deeper dito sa 1948. Pag Palestine kasi, it's, it was never really a country, di ba? How would you describe it? Was it a territory, a region, a land? Um, when you say Palestine back then, uh, ano siya? The reason why we have countries is a very Western state of mind, no? It, you have to put states in it. That's why, like, that is what the Western has put. But when it comes to Palestine, it was land it was what you see right now that everybody can point to and say it's israel but actually that entire piece of land that that entire region was colonized like you said by the british it became the british mandate of palestine and then when they were decolonizing it already because they because already there were talks with palestinian people saying that we wanted our own independence they promised it to another group of people who are not even from the land so it's like moving the the ownership from British colonizers to Zionist Jewish colonizers, which is also what a lot of Arabs around the around the region, they didn't want because it was at the expense of the people who were already living there. If it were to be like, okay, you know what, you can come and live with my 
live with us. That's no problem. It's like accepting refugees. The Philippines have have accepted refugees before, but it was not at the expense of other Filipino people. So that's the main uh, concern of a lot of the Arabs and the Palestinians there, because why would we give up our land um, without any consent? Why would we give up our land while you are also killing our people? Because in 1948, it wasn't just here's a piece of land. It wasn't just that. We can also look at the massacres of Tantura, where there were seven, several people who were killed by the Zionist Jews. There has been a documentary already that has been published by Israelis that are talking about the massacres to reach to the 1948 uh, partition to, to divide the land for Palestinians and for Jewish people. So it wasn't just, just talks that angered many Arabs and Palestinians. It was the fact that it was forcibly taken forcibly taken, not just by talks again, it was forcibly taken through massacres, through ethnic cleansing, through the genocide of the people. So that was, that's something that has been taken out of the context or out of, um, out of conversations when it comes to the history. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, you know, fast forwarding now to 2023, there's been this bloody history and the bloody origins of this whole situation, but uh, Israel is is a reality, no? I mean, and Arab states around it have kind of, at least many of them, have reconciled themselves to the reality of Israel, no? Mm -hmm. And make you know normalization of relations and and all of that. No, so what do you would be a more perfect world there? What can you envision? Like, what kind of world? They, for example, like when you have grandchildren, I mean, what what kind of Middle East would you want for them? When it comes to the solution, I think that's the root question. No, what is the solution here? What, how can we make this a peaceful res resolution for the people who are living there? It's really more about a free Palestine. And free Palestine means not the eradication of Israel, but really giving them back their rights, their human rights, giving back also their justice, because right now they are ex experiencing apartheid. They are experiencing um, a military occupation. They are experiencing more and more settlers who are annexing them because there is continuous annexation, which is illegal according to the United Nations for the Palestinians. So we will say, in my opinion, the perfect world is a free Palestine, liberation of the Palestinians who are already dispossessed, who don't have a state because it's not a state. If it, People mm -hmm. will argue that they have their own land in the West Bank and in Gaza, but it's being controlled by Israeli military. And it's a liberation also for the people who have suffered almost a century for being occupied and living up, living under the Israeli rule. So a lot of people will say, okay, dalawa lang yung solution jan, two-state solution or one-state solution. Pero mahirap yung two-state solution because right now, we already agreed, diba? 1967, meron ng partition plan, which is to have the two-state solution, Gaza Strip and West Bank for the Palestinian people and everything else for the Israelis. Okay, sige, sabihin natin nandiyan na yan. But the thing is, if you look at the maps right now, there are increasing settlements which are being subsidized by Israeli government. They have paid people to live in that land and it has already been condemned by the United Nations. It has been condemned by the Geneva Convention, it has been condemned by the World Court already. But yet they still do it because they have the backing of the United States. And the settlements are built there on purpose so that Pal Palestinians can come together. And you'll see the apartheid because Israelis can get citizenship, full citizenship, Palestinians cannot. They have access to resources like water, but Palestinians get access to, to water once a week. The Israelis have checkpoints. Palestinians have restriction of movement. So the intentions are already clear in the West Bank. No, na the two state solution is not going to work because that's not what they want. So sabihin natin sige, one state na lang tayo. We'll all live under one state. Sabihin natin one state is going to be Israel rather than Palestine. But that's also against the Zionist dream because they have always said that Israel is for the Jewish and Jewish alone. They claim to be a democracy. So, okay. Democracy. That means they need to give all Palestinians who are living in the West Bank and Gaza full citizenship and voting rights. But that means that their, the current population of Israelis and Palestinians would be equal. And if Palestinians were able to vote against the Israeli parliament, then they wouldn't want that to happen. 
currently 2 million out of 9 million of Israelis are Palestinians, actually. Now, they were just given semi-citizenship. So they want to block that. That's why one state under Palestine, uh, one state under Israel or a two-state solution, it won't work right now. What we want is, like we said, a free Palestine for them to have their own um, justice and to be able to fight for their own freedoms. But aren't there Arabs and even Muslims who are currently sense of Israel? I mean, I've I've been following uh, an an Arab Israeli uh, news anchor who's been who's who's been outspoken about these issues as well. I mean, she, you know, it's emphasized that she's an Arab uh, Israeli. Israeli, so, yeah. Hindi naman lahat Jew, hindi naman lahat Jewish ang ang citizens ng Israel. That's true. So technically, Palestinians can become full full citizens of Israel. Tama ba yun? Well, if you really want to be technical with it, they have citizenship, but there's also a color base. So it's still under an apartheid. You can have Israeli mm-hmm. citizenship, but it will be a color green rather than a color blue. And you still have certain mm-hmm. limitations. Mm-hmm. So it's not really that they are given full citizenship. I have friends who are Palestinians, but they have an Israeli citizenship, and they tell me they can't do X, Y, Z. They can't be in certain... Um, they can't have certain jobs. They can't do certain things. They are still limited. But, but again, it's not that Israel is under an apartheid. It's the greater Israel or the occupied territories like West Bank and Gaza that are under the apartheid. So that has to be put into perspective as well. So it don't, this vision of a free Palestine, uh, I, what, what would that what would that be composed of? I, that, would that be Gaza plus West Bank, or at least West Bank that's not uh, occupied already by uh, Israelis? Where would the pre, this free Palestine state be? It would be in the same lands. It would be taking out the blockade between Gaza and the rest of Israel. It would be taking out also the blockade in West Bank because there was also a blockade there between the settlements and then the rest of the West Bank. Um, mm-hmm. So that's number one. That's number one. And then giving back the freedom or giving back just the justice because if you look at the statistics alone, it's it doesn't compare to any other democracy. If you want, you want it to be a full democracy, then give it back to every Palestinian people. If the question is, do we give back the land? Do we give the, back the country to Palestinian people? That would be ideal, to be honest, because like we already mentioned, the intention of the Israeli government, especially now under Netanyahu's uh, leadership, it's not for the Palestinians to have their own justice. They're really making life so difficult to the point where you have to leave or you have to suffer. Those are the two things. And we can see the suffering. We can see the blockade. We can see the open air prison. We can see... Like to date, since October 7, one uh, almost 2,000 of people in the West Bank have been put in jails for no apparent reason. There was an increase in night raids, increase in mass incarceration, and we even have 1,000 um, children, children meaning 18 and below, uh, who have been put in jails because everyone is so distracted with what's happening in Gaza that nobody looks to the West Bank and sees the actual apartheid going on. So when people are afraid of giving back the land to Palestinian people because people think, okay, baka kasi pag binalik natin sa Palestinians, re-resbakan nila yung mga, yung mga Israeli or yung mga citizens ng Jews. Why is it always perceived that there will be bad things that are happening? And also, look at what happened in South Africa. It was given back to the South Africans. Apartheid no longer exists. And it wasn't, it had to get to be back. It had to be given back through violence because they did have that in South Africa. But now it's under the South Africans rule and not under the mm-hmm. colonizers. So why yeah, can't yeah. we have that well, same vision? You're not, no? Usually when apartheid is mentioned, it's in the context of South Africa. No? But you're saying yes. that uh, something similar, a similar system exists now, currently uh, in mm-hmm in these territories, these where Palestinians live. Right? So basically, 
para sa mga Pilipino, ano ba yung apartheid? No? Uh, wala tayong masyadong experience dyan. Uh, oh, maybe there's some discrimination against some ethnic groups, no? but it's not like built into the law, di ba? Unlike in, in South hmm. Africa or even in the United States nung nagkaroon ng segregation, racial segregation. No? So, what is what is apartheid? Apartheid is definitely, let's make it simple, it's treating a certain race differently than your own race. Yun na yun. Yun yung pinaka- simplified exam uh, simplified definition para sa lahat ng mga nanonood or nakikinig ngayon. So, kunwari nasa Pilipinas tayo, bilang Pilipino, lahat ng mga um, rights ko ay intact. Walang pwedeng pumigil sa akin, lahat meron ako. Pero kapag ikaw ay isang dayuhan na pumunta dito sa Pilipinas, iba yung rules sa iyo, iba yung rules sa akin. Lalo na yung basic mm-hmm. rights, yung basic human rights magiging iba. Mm-hmm. It's not just cultural. It's it's it. There's there's actually policy in the West Bank. You can see that there are ro- roads specifically for Israelis and roads specifically for Palestinians. So that's segregation already. There's also mm-hmm. work permits that are given to the Palestinians in order for them to work, and they are put into these checkpoints, which are inhumane. Hundreds of people that are put into these small little checkpoints, and they have to go through. But Israelis don't have to do that. So there's there's already a difference in how we how we treat Palestinians and how we treat Israelis. That's policy already. So that's already part of the apartheid. Kasi hindi lang siya cultural, hindi lang siya religious. It's really embedded in the mm. law. Even in incarceration, um, Israelis have the right to an attorney. Israelis have a right to trial. But right now, Palestinians don't even have the right to to go to trial anymore. Um, there are there are children as well who are being put into jails without even attorneys or even uh, parental guidance at all. So all of this can be, actually all of this has already been condemned by the United Nations and Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch Group. It's just that it's now being amplified because of, uh, because of October 7. Before that, People were just like, ah, ganun, but ganun talaga, may conflict lang sila, may away lang sila. But it's not. It's really a, an occupying or a colonial power that is being in charge of these Palestinian people. So you've pointed out problems in the media coverage. No? So what's ano your main mm-hmm. critique mo, uh, sa coverage ng media, ng mga, itong mga issues dyan sa Middle East? I think that it's not accurate or there, there is no... There's no proportionate response that they have given from the media to Palestinian people. They don't represent the Palestinian perspective. There are also language in the media that dehumanizes Palestinians. Because tignan mo naman yung mga headlines natin. X number of Israelis are killed while X number of Palestinians died. So died is a very passive word rather than mm-hmm. killed, which is a very mm-hmm. aggressive adjective to say. So... Iba talaga pagdating sa media, ang tingin nila sa mga Palestinians ay parang deserving na sila na mamatay. Not saying all media, of course, but a lot of the Western media is like that. Not enough Palestinians are being heard. And when there are actual Palestinians who are finally invited to speak, the first thing that they are asked to do is, or asked is, do you condemn Hamas? Rather than having to explain to you our actual experiences what we are seeing what we are hearing what we what we are experiencing in general i mean even the media they started to talk about these headlines that has happened ever since october 7 we had the worst news which is 40 beheaded babies but yet even the israeli defense forces claimed that this never happened because there's no evidence so but the western media continued to post about it until they had to retract it later on because it just made it made sense to them. Like, oh, Arabs? I'm sure they beheaded the babies. They never even bothered to verify these claims before actually putting it on the headlines. So this is the kind of representation or misrepresentation, rather, that we are fighting um, on top of the propaganda that we're already trying to trying to fight against on social media. If you look at the news and if you look at social media, the news is all mostly pro-Israel. They talk about Israeli voices, Israeli stories, Israeli victims. But most of the things that you see are on on Instagram, on TikTok, that are actual footage of the people 
of Palestine, of Gaza that are being treated the way they are right now, that are being that are, that are being killed at, right now. For me, ha, yan yung nangyayari talaga sa portrayal ng media. If I may criticize the Filipino media, if I may do so, I'm going to be putting myself in hot waters, but here it is. I think Filipino media, especially the news, if it's an international news, they don't really have a lot of people who investigate it themselves. They always base it off of other international news outlets. Um, to be fair, we don't we don't really have as much resources as these international news outlets. We don't have like a lot of a lot of reporters who are on the ground right now in Gaza. So we rely on these international media outlets. So maybe that's one thing that I can also say, particularly pagdating sa um, local news outlets natin dito sa Pilipinas. Well, that's fair enough, no? But on the part of government naman, uh, <laughs> which you'd expect to be a bit more um, diplomatic, di ba? Mm-hmm. Uh, y- you've seen the, the recent tweet by uh, Philippine ambassador to the United Kingdom, Teddy Luxin, no? which he deleted mm-hmm. right away. He did, Pero yeah. kumalat muna, and of course, na-screenshot na siya, and... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you, you know what it said, right? I don't even yes. want to repeat the, uh, you know what it said, because it's sobrang grotesque yung yung thought, no? It's not worth uh, repeating, but it's that it's offensive, no matter who you are, diba? I mean, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm being partisan here by saying it was offensive, no? Mm-hmm. Pero, because uh, you've you you've said in the past, and you said during you know a few minutes ago that you've had to insist na na tao rin kami, di ba? Na, mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of dehumanization going on. No? But um, would you say that was an example? Itong tweet ni ni Luxin? Where was that coming from? Do you think? Uh, of course, we know that he's he he tweets like that. No, uh, Major, yeah. that's his brand. No, he, that's really his brand. Uh, no matter uh, what he what he what the issue is. No, but mm-hmm. ito uh, Major, he crossed the line there. No, but uh, ano ano yung ano ano yung re- re- reaction mo dun? So totoo lang, it's not enough that he is a Philippine ambassador. He is also a former DFA secretary. So that says a lot about his words, di ba? Um, parang mahirap din talaga na pakinggan yan sa isang Pilipino, lalo na kapag isang Pilipino na may may power as an ambassador representing the Philippines itself. And I'm yes, like what you said, he's known for having tweets like this or having comments like this. But this just goes to show that recklessness has no place anymore in social media. You can't just be reckless and saying whatever you want and thinking that it's not going to be called out, especially now in this generation where every little thing can be criticized, more so if you're a political figure. So, sabi niya, ang narinig ko is it was taken out of context, that it was made uh, he, under... He, he said he was being sarcastic tone down. Sarcastic, oh, oh, yan yung sarcastic oh, oh. tone daw. But it goes to show na... You you have to use your voice responsibly. This is not just for him. This is for every other person who wants to talk about these issues. You need to make sure that you you know your power and that what effect what effect it can have on these people. Imagine there is an increase increase in Islamophobic attacks already in the United States because there's continuous dehumanizing rhetoric, just like what's happening with. Um, Ang ba Teddy Loxin, yung kahit accidental or sarcastic man yung kanyang sinasabi, meron talaga magre-react at meron din talagang masasaktan kasi ginagamit din nila yung mga salita niya as an excuse to hurt these other people, whether it's Palestinians or even Muslims in general. So, ganun din yung nangyayari. Another uh, intro to a uh, Palestine question, ano? So, what sure. is there a difference? What's the difference between Palestinian and Arab? Or I mean, it's a very naive question, no? but maybe some no, people okay. listening are wondering. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so that's a good question. So basically, uh, all Palestinians are Arabs, but not all Arabs are Palestinians. So, parang mm-hmm. bring it to the context of um, the Philippines. No, all Filipinos are Asians, but not all Asians are Filipinos. Let's make it even more local. All Bisayas are Filipino, but not all Filipino are Bisaya. Lang yun. Okay. So yes, we right. are so part eth- of the. So same. it's a it's a it's a su- kind of a sub ethnic group or an ethnic group within the Arab population world, yes. or Arab yes uh, Ar- within the Arab world. Okay, uh, malinaw malinaw. In the same way, na you know, when I went to Iraq, 
even within Iraq, maraming, you know, it was very diverse culturally, di ba? May mga, may mga Kurds. You know, uh, si, you know, L- Luxin is an ambassador. He has a he has a platform, no? Uh, mm. Official, very powerful, influential platform. But you too, no? I mean, you're not in the government, yes. but uh, you're, you're so, you know, you're beauty queen, no? I mean, you're, you're branding mo, no? Uh, you're not just uh, some, you're not just a, an outspoken Palestinian Filipina, but, you know, you're, you're beauty queen. You're usually, you're preceded by that. No. Ah, uh, mo may responsibilidad. Yung mga katulad mo na naging celebrity, uh, you know, beauty queens, artistas, uh, you know, people in show business na magkaroon ng mga ganitong advocacy. I mean, you don't you don't hear former beauty queens speak like you. Um, you know, especially in such a um informed manner no i have to say i mean you're, you're very informed no i know that beauty queens are are instructed to have advocacies no para so dun sa question and answer they can you know they can sound intelligent or they can speak intelligently about something no but ikaw you've really devoted time to studying this but ano yung ano is there a connection did you feel that you needed to advocate kasi nagkaroon ka ng platform so I am currently also doing coaching for other beauty queens as well, internationally and locally, mm-hmm. for Q&A and mm-hmm. for their advocacies. But I really joined the beauty pageant industry because I have advocacies. It's not the other way around. It wasn't, nag-beauty queen muna ako, tsaka na lang ako nagkaroon ng advocacy. Kaya rin ako nag-beauty queen kasi sabi ko, parang yung boses ko, maliit pa. Like, I want to be able to influence more people pag pag beauty queen ka kasi parang ang dali naman maniwala sa iyo ano mo yon getting sponsorships or getting support from people to help your advocacy at that time i was uh creating a blood drive for 300 blood uh blood bags and giving it to the to the philippine blood center um and napansin ko bago ako naging beauty queen mahirap na mahirap na kumuha ng support nung naging beauty queen ako sobrang dali na nakita nila may corona ka may sash ka here's my money please help what you need to help because credible ka na so for me that was my journey into becoming a beauty queen i think in this day and age of 2023 it's no longer about trying to be trendy trying to just be beautiful we can even see it in the trend of beauty queens all over the world they are asking harder more difficult questions they are asking for proof of your advocacy it's no longer just ah, maganda ka, paso ka na. you have to care deeply about something to become a beauty queen in my in my opinion i think the more successful beauty queens are the ones who actually have something to say who actually have a uh something that they care about and they're the ones who have longevity the others they stay for a while, but you don't see them as loud or as involved. You might see them in a few ads or on social media, but you won't see them on the news. You won't see them being involved with the Filipinos. And I think that's what we need to see more and more. Even artistas, to be honest. And dami kong na-unfollow na American artists um, because mm-hmm. of their because of the way that they support um, what's happening right now. So for me... Ako, you know you have this platform. You know you have this influence. If you're not, if you're not well versed or if you're not educated enough, you should be, because you have that effect on people. So this is a day and age where it is time for us to get back to our humanity. We are behind social media all the way, but we are just being distracted by the content of laughs and dances and trends but no longer in the stories of the people and that's why you know i just gotta say with that's why i love documentaries so much because they are about the human life and they are about the human stories and my vlogs if you'll see are, are the people are the things that i posted about i've been trying to post more about uh businesses of the filipinos in las Pinas and in other areas because they have that story to tell it's no longer just, hey, punta kayo dito kasi may promo sila, but more about just supporting local businesses as well. So that's one of the many advocacies that I have, including the Palestinian uh, cause. So hopefully more and more people will acknowledge the fact that they need to be that driving force on social media. You've spoken of having survivor's guilt. no? I mean, as yes. a Palestinian outside of Palestine, kind of watching from the outside what's going on there. What, what do you mean by that? Survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt is, I see a lot of people who are from 
from my land, my people, my blood, right? Not just my family, but the people who, where I come from. When when there is hurt in the Philippines, then I would hurt with the Filipino people, whether I'm there or I'm not. It's the same thing with Palestine. They are hurting right now. And I feel so bad that I'm not there doing actual work. I feel so bad that I have this privilege of living a safe life with my family, with my friends. I don't have, I don't have to worry about if I sleep tonight, will I be awake tomorrow morning? I don't have to worry about where I'm going to get my food and water. But the people in Palestine have that every single day. I have to look at my friends, message them, and ask them not how are you, but are you alive? Yun yung tanong. Napaka, napaka, it's unfathomable that we got to this place where ang tanong ko is, buhay ka pa ba? Diba? Napaka sakit din na isipin na today, buhay sila bukas, baka hindi na. So I feel that survivor's guilt, but it's very small compared to everything else that we're experiencing as the Palestinian people in diaspora because we also feel like we are unheard. We're experiencing gaslighting, victim blaming or victim shaming. Um, we're also experiencing a lot of people who are just currently attacking us. Someone took my posts and my profile and posted it in the Zionist um, account. And then now I'm getting bombarded with a lot of hate um, on social media, whether it's on my comments, which I delete right away, or um, on my messenger. They message me every day. So this is just a fraction of what the Palestinians are experiencing. And I feel bad even complaining about it because I really am not. I'm. This is nothing compared to what they're experiencing. Talaga. But if I may ask, no, generally... What's the theme of these messages? I mean, is it just venom or is there an argument or what What are they saying? A lot of them are just saying like, go back to Gaza then, go get killed with them. You know, like some of them are just saying like, you're a liar, you, uh, you're a fake person, you made this profile, but it's all fake. You spot fake things, you spot propaganda. A lot of people are just telling me nasty things, honestly, like racist things as well. Like, and they don't they disregard the fact that I'm Filipino. They just couldn't they just go straight to the fact that I'm Palestinian and say really bad things. Th- these comments are coming from Filipinos or from Filipinos, I get less aggressive ones, more questioning, but these ones are coming from Zionist like Israeli or internationally, even one that's come one that I saw that's coming from Portugal. But the ones that are coming from Filipinos are really like, uh, hindi mo ba alam yung mga Arabo masasamang tao, yan yung isa sa mga matinding nakukuha ko, or yung mga Muslim, lahat naman sila, suicide bombers, yun, yan yung mga na- masasakit na nakukuha ko sa mga Pinoy, kapwa kong Pinoy. So yung mga ganyan, iniisip ko na baka kasi they're very ignorant. I don't blame them kasi yun nga ang nakikita natin yung mga nasa international media eh. Um, mar- marami sa kanila ay hindi galing sa labas, di ba? Marami sa kanila ay hindi nakapag hindi nakapag-travel at all. They're not like you and me who were able to see other people, other Arabs and say, Mm-mm. "No, the Arabs are not like that." So, I don't hate them. Yes, it's hurtful. Um, a lot on Insta uh, on TikTok talaga. That day I did like a series about what's going on in Palestine and a lot of them were Filipinos who commented na may Hamas sila, may ganito sila. Parang it's an, an it, parang they're using Hamas as an excuse to genocide or to kill other Palestinians. So those are the hurtful comments that I get. You've said in the past, no? Uh, I mean, lo- long before October 7, that you want to go to Palestine. Yes. Do you still want to go? For sure. 100%. 100% still want to go. What would you do? Mainly just get more and more content and show what the Palestinian people are all about. Maybe talk more to the Palestinians who are there and ask them what they need. What is it that they want me to share with the rest of the world? Because honestly, they don't even ask for aid anymore. They just ask for help to get their stories out there. My my brother went to Palestine, as I mentioned, and I'm so jealous because he got to meet with these Palestinians and got to see what life is like. And now he's even more convinced in talking about it. That's why he's so uh, he's so passionate also about sharing the Palestinian history and Palestinian cause 
mm-hmm. and what's going on right yeah. now. And is this Chester, Ch- your brother? Chester. Chester yes, Saldua? Chester. Yeah, you're, Chester yeah your, Saldua. your brother's a professional. Yeah, he's a professional PBA basketball player. Yes. So he has. Yes. He also has a platform. At uh, so he feels as strongly as you. He does. He does. Issues. He even has been there, Deba. Right? And as a as a hmm. Filipino, he he actually has an American citizenship because he was born in the United States. So when he okay, got there, so it's there, easier for him to travel. It's easier for him to travel. When he got there, he was interrogated for six to seven hours by the uh, Tel Aviv airport. Hmm. The people there, be- just because his six to seven his middle hours. Name. Oh. Six to seven hours. Yeah, I was calling him every hour. Ano nangyari? Ano nangyari? Because we were afraid that he was going to get deported, just because of the fact that my mother's maiden name is on his passport as well. They took his phone. They asked his lineage. They asked. Sino yung lolo mo? Sino yung lolo ng lolo mo? Sino yung tita mo? Ano yung pangalan? Saan ba sila nakatira? Like, these are questions that you don't really ask in immigration. You usually just say, like, what's the purpose of your visit? And then, what do you have in your in your, in your your items or in your person? So, it's it's crazy. Wow. Uh, mabigata. <laughs> and and that, there's a lot to unpack. It's, it's been painful in some ways, but enlightening. So thank you for sharing uh, today and uh, and for speaking up. Mabuhay ka. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Howie. I really appreciate your time and uh, for giving me a platform to speak about um, Palestine and also the things that I have been doing as a um, Palestinian Filipino. Okay. Maraming salamat, Zara Z. Saldua. Hi, I'm Howie Severino. Check out the Howie Severino podcast. New episodes will stream every Thursday. Listen for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other platforms. This podcast seeks to be a platform for diverse voices on important issues. We will be featuring other perspectives on the conflict in Israel in the coming weeks.